Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our service today. Endurance Church of the Valley is a Bible-based church that seeks to glorify God through the fulfillment of the Great Commission by reaching, connecting, training, and sending God's people into the world. Please mark your calendars to join the ECV Women's and Men's Ministries on Saturday, July 10th from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. for our Zoom Fellowship and Bible Study. Zoom links will be sent for these separate group sessions via Flocknote. Try to stay cool, and we look forward to seeing you there. ECV has ministry opportunities in the areas of multimedia, small groups, VIP, and church administration. For more information, please fill out a Connect card and indicate the ministry you're interested in. Offerings to the church can be made by texting 481-2055-2715-803-4772. You can also go to endurancechurch.com and click on the Give link at the top of the page. We are very glad you've chosen to worship with us this morning. We hope you will enjoy the rest of the service today. Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Malachi chapter 4. Yep, Tiago, that's the correct image. Malachi chapter 4. It's awesome um, how God lays out the preaching calendar. You begin to see how the Holy Spirit is all in and through what's going on in this church. We are reaching the end of Malachi. Um, We started in 2019. It was cut short in 2020. We picked it back up and we have finished we're getting ready to finish uh, the book of Malachi. But what I wanted to show you is a moment that changed my life forever. I played football, uh, junior college, um, 1996 through 98 for the Hutchinson Community College Blue Dragons who just won the uh, NJCAA National Championship. I transferred to Bowling Green State University and I was working my way up the depth chart. We were getting ready to play the University of Missouri. I was um, the starting X receiver and I was the starting kick returner. I caught a pass And when I caught the pass, there was a linebacker who came to hit me. And I stuck my hand out. And my finger got caught in his face mask. And so I continued, because I'm a soldier, to go through practice the best way that I could. But I noticed my pinky didn't look right. And so I was under uh, the tutelage of a very um, hard coach. The type of coach that essentially asks you, are you injured or are you hurt? And so I came up to him, I said, coach, my pinky don't look right. He was like, get away from me, son, I'm not the trainer. So he sends me to the trainer. The trainer's like, we have to go to the hospital immediately. We get to the hospital and they take an x-ray. And when they took an x-ray, they had discovered that I had a spiral fracture. Now, this spiral fracture is when it gets twisted in a particular position and it basically snaps and it snaps almost like in two vertically. And so, I couldn't play. And I was trying my best to come back, but they had inserted pins into my pinky. And so they told me that I couldn't sweat. Um, They told me that Um, I couldn't work out, that I wasn't able to use my hand the way that I could because, you know, as a football guy, you know, you're trying to be tough. You're trying to work through every single pain that you have. So weeks went by and eventually I got back on the field only to break these two fingers. So if you've ever wondered why my fingers look like this, now you get the backstory. 
so my junior season was essentially a wash. And so there was a teammate of mine, Big Bub from Detroit. And Big Bub said, I think you should try playing defense. He said, you've never played defense before in your life. I think you should play defense. I think you have the attitude to be a cornerback. And so I went to the coach and the rest was history. It changed my entire career, changed my profession simply because of this fracture. See, that fracture in that moment created a crisis moment for me. And it's interesting because you can have a fracture, you can still function, but you can't function effectively. You can't function efficiently. This fracture caused a crisis moment in my life. But the question that we must ask in regards to this fracture and the relationship with crisis is when does something become a crisis moment? When does it? Scott, when does a moment become a crisis moment? Anya, when does a moment become a crisis moment? Because obviously, Josh, everything can't be a crisis moment. Well, I would contend that an individual who can properly interpret the relationship between cause and effect and the value of that cause and effect begins to understand a crisis. A crisis. If you are living in the United States of America, there are a number of different crisis moments that we have. The other day, as I was surfing on YouTube, I saw that we have a water crisis. But the Colorado River is beginning to dry up. The Hoover Dam, the water is at an all-time low. Now for us right now, you think it doesn't affect you. But it affects the water in Phoenix, the water in Utah, the water in Nevada. It, it's, it's central here to the Southwest. We got a water crisis, if you didn't know. Be prepared within the next year and a half that there are going to be regulations regarding our water. We've got a racial crisis in America right now. Now we have May Juneteenth, a federal holiday. We have segregation in the church. We've got in the Southern Baptist Convention all kinds of fractures that have now become a crisis moment. We've got a church crisis that the average church goer nowadays goes to church one time in six weeks. That is the average. We have a church crisis in regards to pastors who will actually preach the full counsel of God. We have a crisis. We have an unemployment crisis. There are many right now who are deciding whether to go back to work because the employment was actually giving them more money than, than working. We've got an educational crisis. What do we teach in schools now? I'm seeing almost every single day there's somebody else going before the school board to contend against the critical race theory. There are schools that are intentionally from the very top attempting to push aside the truth about history for all of us. 
We've got educational crisis. We've got educational crisis because teachers need to get paid more. Amen? Amen. They need to get paid more. But people don't want to pay up. So teachers have to strike. We've got to go to those in whom are the lawmakers. Those in whom would help in our legislation and help in this crisis. As Brother Howard and I and Stephanie were on a Zoom call this week, we have a homeless crisis. I remember growing up, I never saw someone homeless in Wichita, Kansas. I just didn't. Now, the more that I'm venturing out, it's, I'm seeing it everywhere. And it's not the people whom you think. But you know there's one crisis, Chip, that you'll never hear about in the media. A fatherless crisis. We could talk about drugs and what it's doing to our communities and to our families. We can talk about the LGBTQ community and the crisis and what they feel is inequality and injustice and all that. We can do that, but let me tell you this. The media will never touch a fatherless crisis. You'll never turn on the television to hear about the fatherless crisis. And so we're not, or I'm not specifically talking about simply a physical absence from the home. I'm talking about the actual spiritual, emotional presence of a father at home. Teaching and guiding and leading. We have a father fracture in this country that is causing a crisis. And if it's not important, it'll simply just be overlooked. But we've got some daddy issues in the United States of America. If we're diligent Bible students, we will have noticed by now as we've went through the entire book of Malachi that he's not talking to the wives. He's not talking to the women. He's speaking specifically to the fathers. Specifically to the fathers. And he's telling them the fracture between you and I has created a crisis moment. See, crisis becomes critical when we overlook the signs that cause permanent damage. Much like chest pain. See, when you're younger, it's like, oh, it, that'll go away. That was just something, right? But when you get older, your heart starts feeling funny. You go to run, and it's just not the same. And there's a pain that you haven't felt before. And there becomes a hardening of the arteries that you don't see, but we keep overlooking it, creating a critical moment in which Either there's going to be blockage to the brain causing a stroke or blockage to the heart causing a heart attack. And it becomes a critical moment and you sit down with the doctor, you know what they do. They begin to take all of these different tests to show you that there's been a hardening over time. Because that time in your 20s when the doctor told you to eat right, you ignored him. When he told you to exercise, you ignored him. Because when you looked in the mirror, you look good. Because you can run around with your kids and felt good, I'm good. The doctor doesn't know what he's talking about. Until it becomes a critical moment and unfortunately a critical moment can come too late when you're picking up on the signs that you should have long time ago.
fathers are God's gatekeepers. They're the gatekeepers. Our role hasn't changed from the garden. Our role has not changed from the garden. But when a father neglects his duty as a gatekeeper, then the family and the role of the father begin to mutate over time because it's constantly being redefined. I don't know what cartoons you grew up on. I love the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Kids, do you guys like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? There we go. Who knows all the turtles? Okay. Which child? <laughs> Which, okay, we got Michelangelo, we got Donatello, we got Leonardo, and then we got Raphael. But how did we get these Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? There was a mutation. And if you think about what the definition of mutation is, let me share it with you from the dictionary. It says, mutation is the changing of the structure of a gene that results in a variant form that may be transmitted to subsequent generations. It's caused by the alteration of the DNA and the chromosomes within it, either by deletion or insertion or a rearrangement that creates a mutation and it turns into something that it was never meant to be. We have a father deficiency in the DNA of the family. And when we have a father deficiency, the family mutates and turns into something it was never meant to be. But it can be reversed when we turn back to God. When we turn back to God. Let's read Malachi chapter 4 verse 4 through 6. After we have left now the the proclamation of the day of his coming. He starts here in verse 4. Now, remember, these are the last words of the prophet. The last words. Last words are very important. There's no more disputation. There's no more going back and forth with the love and tithes and offerings and leaving. You want to pay attention to last words. And the interesting thing about last words is that they're typically simple in nature. And it's a, not just a reminder, but a remembrance of what is most important. So we know that this generation is basically an apostate generation. They have failed in their ability to uphold the commands of God and depend upon him stripping themselves of blessings because they are under a curse withholding their hearts from God. So after he finishes talking about destruction that's coming and those in whom will be saved, he ends with this, something very simple. Remember the law of my servant Moses. The statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb, another name for Mount Sinai, for all Israel. Verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Now we know when we turn to the book of Mark, we begin to see that this being fulfilled through John the Baptist and the spirit of Elijah. But I also find it interesting that Elijah and Moses are both named here and they are both there at the transfiguration of Jesus. So hold that intention. So as behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts 
of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction in some of your Bibles it says a curse I have one focus today let's talk about healing the father fracture Let's talk about healing the father fracture. Because much like this pinky, I needed pens to support it so that it would grow back properly and I could regain some semblance of function with my pinky. So it is important that if we are talking about healing of a fracture, we got to know what supports that fracture in order to get us out of what some of us may be enduring now, a crisis moment in our families. But maybe you're like me. As I begin to meditate upon this passage, I ask myself, what would cause for fathers to be estranged from their children and what would cause the children to be estranged from their fathers it all begins with God if we can utilize the context in what in which this is being shared it shows you everything does anybody remember what Malachi began with? What the, the issue was, anybody, in Malachi chapter 1, what does he start with? Anybody. There we go, there we go, page is turning. There we go. Yes, chapter 1, verse 2. Oh, go ahead. Oh, we ain't got time to debate now. Come on, bring it now. There you go. It starts when we begin to abandon the presence of God. And we begin to, as fathers, believe that God doesn't love us. And it's a trickle-down effect. Because now, if God don't love me, why do I need to continue in my role as a father with my family? Because as I've heard it said in a meeting, Pastor John had to push back from the table because there was a man that was before us and it was only by the power of prayer of people in his church that he did not get choked. I'm being serious. That this man before myself and Pastor John in a very critical moment with his family, he says, do you guys know in this particular tone, do you guys know how hard it is to be a husband? Am I lying? Do you know, you guys know how hard it is to be a husband? Do you know how hard it is to be a father? Pastor John said, Jesus, take the wheel. And literally pushed back and he, you know, Pastor John left me hanging. It was just like, this one's on you, Pastor. Will you go ahead? Hey, go ahead and get him. I'm not going to share with you what I said to him. But it was holy, God-honoring, and necessary. Let me just say it that way. Nina, you'll get the, the details later. Because you're going to ask. But it's when fathers are possessed with vanity. Running after things in which you believe are important. But your family actually doesn't even care about. Am I the only man? 
that at times runs after things in which you're attempting to help with your family to do the right things and then you look back and you just say, all they wanted to do was just be with me. They didn't care about who I was. They cared about what I was to them. Am I saying I'm a father or am I being a father? I had this moment just yesterday with my son. We were, <clears throat> we were cutting down the, the pool. Yesterday was my daughter's birthday. Today we're celebrating my, my uh, son's birthday. We're all, you know, birthdays in June. I'm, I'm almost birthdayed out, okay? But he was in the backyard with me. We were getting ready to pool because we had an above ground pool that became my two year headache or my one year headache. So I said, we're getting rid of this thing, dump day. I'm getting this out of here. So my son's out there and he's helping me out. We out there in the heat. We out there for about an hour. I've got this little three-year-old about to be four. He out there helping. And when I sat down, that's when this passage hit me. I'm sitting down. I'm hot. He talking about, Daddy, we doing hard work. We sweating. <laughs> he tried to give me direction. He said, you take the big stuff, I take the small stuff. But as I sat down, I looked at my peripheral, and it was joy. You know why? He's just out there with his dad. He don't care about me and the pastor. He don't care about how many books I done read. He don't care about how much money we make. He was out there, feet just off the chair, 115 degrees. Don't call CPS on me. <laughs> they already did it. Somebody on speed dial right now. And he just wanted to be with his father. But did I want to be with my son in the same way that my son wanted to be with his father. Sometimes we're possessed with vanity. Sometimes we're just, we're self-serving with the belief that we're actually doing the right thing. And the reality is, is we're competitive. We want more as opposed to the best and what's better. For some of us, it can be difficult because you are at home. But my question is, are you absent and distracted? Absent and distracted. We've given distraction, you know, this priority when it's just recycled temptation. It's recycled temptation. I sat on um, my favorite place to um, meditate and work, USA. And there was um, a father and son that were sitting across from me. And I'm an eavesdropper. I'm nosy. I'm a people watcher. That just comes from, that's some of my hood showing up. I got to see where you at, what you doing. Because if things pop off, I got to have an exit strategy. Am I the only person looking at extra strategies nowadays? I'm watching how you wobbling in. I'm like, you may have to go. So I pay attention to my surroundings. And I watch for an entire hour as this man sat here on his phone, scrolling his life away in front of his teenage son who was scrolling life away for an hour. Look, I'll be honest. There are some of us who bring our children to church and we do the same thing. We do the same thing. Give them this screen. Just give it to them. And they continue to scroll. And I wrote a letter. And I paid for the meal. They didn't talk the entire time. The only time that they said anything 
was in regards to their condiments. And so I wrote them a short letter. And it said, essentially, you don't know how much time you have with the person in front of you. They need a relationship, not a screen. They need eyes that look back, not a dark window. And I said, I don't have my father around. I wish I could have just a couple more moments. And yet you have this young man in front of you waiting for you to speak to him and affirm him. And you chose to make something else besides your family more important. And I said, put down the screen and talk to your kid. And I paid for his meal. Are we absolutely distracted? Look, I need brothers in Christ to help me. One of the best things that I heard come out of our leadership meetings one time is I confessed that to my leaders. And right before I was getting off, Elder Jimmy, Pastor Will I said what's up he said go play with your kids go right now don't do anything else I know you can find something to do go play with your kids do you hear what he said he didn't say go be with them go play with them I have to be told that now, for some of you that may be critical of what I just said, that's okay, but let me share with you something. Is that when you grow up in a home and there's no father there, you have great difficulty in how it is to engage with your own kids. I had to look in the mirror, and I can share this publicly. I shared it in one of my classes in seminary because it set someone else free. I had to practice saying the word son in the mirror because I never heard it growing up, ever. Not in a way that affirmed that I was someone's son. I had to practice saying that. Lucas, my son, my son, come here. My son, this, my son, that. I said it, it sounded awkward coming out because I had never heard those words before in my home. But you know what happened as I shared that? There was an Asian man on the other side who just burst into tears and began to weep in a class. And he says, I thought I was the only one. He says, I'd never received love from my father. And he says, I don't know how that feels either. And we got up in the middle of class and hugged. Why would fathers be estranged from their children? If God doesn't love me, and if God doesn't love me, then the role that he's given me as a priest, I'm going to abandon that. I'm going to allow anything to be placed upon the altar. I'm going to divorce my wife of my youth. I am going to divide the community. I am going to serve another God. I'm going to withhold my tithes and offerings. You see how this begins to have a trickle effect all through the book of Malachi. Why? Because there's fractures within the family of God. The reality is, is godly fathers who don't live for God are in danger of fracturing the faith of their family. I chose those words wisely. I didn't say ungodly fathers. Godly fathers, those who are godly on the outside, who do not live for God because your family is your witness. It's your witness. You can say whatever you want to say. But your family is a witness to how you are 
as a father and as a man. Now that's difficult to hear. That's very difficult to hear. But the reality is, is that from the garden to the end, the responsibility for the family does not change. It's on us, men. It's on us. We want everyone else in the family to change. And God is saying, you can't change them. You can't stop it. You change. We were talking about it in Wednesday morning prayer. I said, if you wanted to really have one phrase for the entire Bible, it's this, return to me. Genesis, return to me. Exodus, return to me. Revelation, you had time to return to me. <laughs> but are we living for God in our homes? Do they see forgiveness? Do they see grace? Do they see mercy? Do they see love? Love! Do they see that? Do they see a dad who sits down and who's in his word and the word is in him? Look, your kids are going to make whatever choices they make. He doesn't hold you responsible for the outcome, but the input. I'm not responsible as a pastor for the outcome, but the input, the equipping, I am held responsible. And I take that serious. Fathers, back up off the pressure. It, you can't change your kid. You can't. But what you can do is you can be a heck of a model. A heck of a model. Your kids need to see that a father loves their mother. They need to see intimacy. Physical intimacy. Not just, I love your mom. Look, my kid got in trouble at school because of that. He saw so much hugging and kissing at home that I'm getting a call from the daycare. And they said, we need to have serious discussion. I'm like, about what? They were like, Lucas is hugging people. You know, he's trying to kiss them on the cheek. And they, now they're looking at because there's two of them now. They, they're looking at me funny. And I said, look, and I used it as a time to witness. I said, me and my wife love one another. And I said, I don't want it to be a figment of their imagination. I want them to have real memories. But every time they see us, we're hugged up. And you know what kids do. As soon as they see mommy and daddy hugged, what do they do? They run right in the middle of it. Right? They want to be part of it. But I want to plant memories that not just daddy loved them because he took them places or took mama places or just got her good stuff, but like there was intimacy. My dad loved my mom. He talked about it. You know, and they were gross in front of me. They need to see that. They need to see that. They need to see two parents going to bed in the same room in the same bed. They need to see that. I grew up in a family of separation and division. I know what it looks like. They don't want to be in the same room as one another. But it's important. The way that people will know that we are disciples of Christ is by what, Michelle? That we shall love for one another. It would be a shame to show love to my neighbor that I won't show in my own home. Some of us, if we're being honest, tr treat strangers better than we treat our spouse and our children. So how do you repair the fractures of a fatherless nation? 
Because in this repairing, we have to see what it is a reflection of. God doesn't call us to do anything in which he won't reveal himself through it. Did you catch that? There isn't a single duty that you have that is not going to reveal the nature nor the character of God. So what does it represent when the fathers are turning back to God? That's what this means. This idiom, that's what it means. Yes, you know what? I can't repeat it because I just forgot what I said. You know, I'm just flowing extemporaneously right now. But I'm going to work it back there, LB. I like that. The returning back to God in this father, child, child, it's a, it's a Hebraic idiom. And what it means essentially is this. When the prophet comes and he divulges the message, the will of God, that whether you are father or child, it is to return to God. But when you return to God, there's a cause and an effect. Because men who can return to God are men who can return back to their family. It is a demonstration and a revelation of who God is. That he is constantly pursuing, constantly desiring that we would reconcile and repent. So I give you three things, very simple. How do you repair the fractures of a fatherless nation? Number one, teach your family to remember Jesus Christ. Now, sounds simple. Because think about it, here we are, and these are the last words. So think about this almost you're at the bedside. Think about even in 1 Kings with King David and he's getting ready to give the throne over to King Solomon. And you know what he says? He says to be bold and act like a man because King Solomon was young. And he tells him this, to observe the laws, the statutes and the commands of the Lord. Walk in his ways. David's getting ready to die. He's on his deathbed. So you're thinking, he's going to bring up, don't do what I did. Don't Obey. Obey. What do we see here? After everything that's been said, remember the law of my servant Moses. The statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. So that immediately should take a people back to why they were even at the mountain in the first place. They were there because God called them to him. And he gave them laws and rules and statutes. Now for some of us, that's why a lot of us didn't come to Christianity. We felt that it was a bunch of rules. It's because of the way maybe it was preached to you. When someone, and more importantly, let's say it this way, when a father and a mother love you, one of the best things they can do is give you boundaries. That lets them know that you care for them. It's a revelation of the lawgiver. It's not essentially just about the law. That's what the Pharisees got. It was about the revelation of the lawgiver. Because based on the law, you can actually begin to see the revelation of the lawgiver. So, if you make laws that are immoral and unethical, what does that say about the nature of the lawmakers? What does it say about them? So he's telling them to remember. Why? Because we forget. Now for some of us, you may be saying, no, it's impossible for me to forget God and how good he is. But let me share this with you. If we could be honest, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. How many of us forgot to read the word of God this week? How many of us forgot to pray? How many of us, if I asked you right now, what is the gospel you just remember? How many
many of you know all the books in the New Testament? How many of us know that Jesus Christ is both Lord and Savior? There are a lot of things in which the prophets of God are asked to do, but when people begin to forget who Christ is, it infiltrates the family, infiltrates the churches, infiltrates the community, and begins to fracture. And now we begin to make up our own definition of what Christianity is, and more importantly, who Christ is. Do you as a father, do you cultivate an awareness of his presence? of his loving, holy, just, and almighty presence? Do we teach to our children that God is present in our thoughts, our speech, and in our actions? How have we as fathers cultivated a biblical worldview? Or have we simply resigned to the fact that the world is going to raise our kids? Have we talked to them about identity and morality and purpose and eternity? And just like Jimmy and I were talking after service, as fathers, are we missing out on the wholeness of Christ? Are our kids even conscious of sin and a Savior? How do you repair it? Teach your family to remember Jesus Christ. Number two, Teach your family to revere Jesus Christ. What do we find all through the book of Malachi? A people who did not fear God. It was only in last week's sermon that we got to a place in which there was a people group who were identified as those who feared God. Do our children fear God? Do they fear God? Now, I guarantee you, right after I've said this, the kids are going to be like, fear God, what does that mean? It's cultivating a presence of both the terrifying reality of how powerful he is and who you're in the presence of and the honor that is due his name. Do our children know about reverence and, and honor of the Lord? Now, this is where it comes back to us as fathers that's difficult to swallow. And it's the secret. It's the secret, not that Oprah secret, you know, what she's got going on, it ain't no secret. It's a secret and it's a conviction that some of us have grown up with. We have to stop believing that Sunday morning at church is the most important day of the week. Now, I'm not being heretical. Allow me to finish. Fathers, even mothers. Are you just a Sunday you on Sunday? Do your children watch you switch up? Now mommy and daddy don't have a foul mouth. Now mommy and daddy are respectful. Now mommy and daddy aren't arguing. You know what the most important day is? There isn't one. Every single day. They need to see Sunday you on Monday. Let me, hold on, let me take it back. They need to see Sunday 9.30 you at 11. They need to see Sunday 9.30 you at 6 o'clock at night when they don't want to go to bed. They need to see 930 you when they've carved their name in your favorite wooden table. 
They want to see 930 you when there's someone in need. They need to see 930 you when they have ticked you off. They need to see 930 you when they leave home and don't ever want to come back. That's where sometimes this mentality, if we could just get them to church, if we could just get them to church, if, we could, if church could just get into you. If church could just get into you. We need fathers who are fathers on Monday morning, Monday afternoon, Monday evening. And it can't just be something we turn on and off. There's no such thing. I can't turn off being a pastor. Some people, maybe that's what they do. At the end of the day, I know this is my calling, so no matter where I go, I'm shepherding. I don't have to turn it on and off. But that's what we got to get to is that Sunday morning is not sim simply the most important day. It's every day. They got to see that what you were hallelujahing about, hallelujahing about on Sunday, do you do it on Monday? When you were praising and worshiping on Sunday morning, do you even do that in the car? When you said that, man, you want to be generous and give to others, but you won't even give to your children, like, there's, a, there's an issue there. Are we, what are we cultivating in our homes? What are we cultivating? Are we cultivating a reverence for God? A time in which you take a time out and you begin to pray. You begin to make a time in which you're approaching the throne of grace as you are approaching the king. I mean, Josh, are we even cultivating the right boundaries in our home? Are we allowing for our children to come home and say, if they're a boy, now I'm a girl. How are we cultivating that? What are we doing with that? Or when individuals say there's no such thing as right and wrong anymore. How are we cultivating reverence for the Lord? How are we cultivating boldness for the Lord? And standing upon the word of God in a world that's simply trying to pull you away. And lastly... I believe that may be the most important. Teach your family to return to Jesus Christ. There's one thing to follow the Lord. But even as adults, when we mess up, when we're in sin, do we know how to return back to the Lord? Do we know how to repent? Or are we just continually saying, God, I'm, I'm sorry. You know why we return? Because what we've seen through Malachi, God is faithful. What did we learn last week? He remembers. He doesn't start you all over again. We've got to teach our kids to return to the Lord. Let them know it's going to be all right. Let them know, I know you have wandered from the truth and make it a point to live out being the father to the prodigal son because as parents, you're going to have to do it every day. Forgiving, reconciling. It's something that in my home, we just experienced. My daughter and I were having some heated fellowship one night. And as we were having heated fellowship, she got up from the table because she's watched too many Disney movies. And she got up from the table and she started to walk away. She was like, I'm basically done with this conversation. I said, no, 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 no. We, we don't do that here. We don't do that. I, you've been watching too many movies. You think you can just go ahead and get up, go upstairs, have, you know, have your moment. Oh, you guys, you guys don't hear me. You don't understand. Well, we ain't gonna have that. And I said, sit your butt down. And we sat down. And I said, and we're going to learn and continue to learn how to return to the table and talk. And what it led to was the next night, she got upset. She sat at the edge of the bed. Me, my wife, 
my daughter, we began to talk. And she was so thankful that she was being heard. But you know what she heard from her father? I said, you're right. You're right. You know what she said? She says, Daddy, you have a habit of every time I do something, you always bring up the negative first. Then you bring up the positive. And I was like, you're right. My fault. I repent. You know how the night ended? With a hug. And she still was like, there's certain things I still don't like about you, Dad. But she says, I know that you love me. I know that you love me. Look. I don't want to leave out a group. I want to thank the mothers who have had to do it on their own. I want to thank the mothers who have had to do it on their own. The ones who have had to be father and mother. I want to thank you. But I want to add to it. It was never designed to be that way. It was never designed to be that way. But you have shouldered that burden. And I pray that God has just provided. Provided. The father fractured. How do we heal it? But the reality is this. When it's all said and done, who will be responsible for the crisis in your family? Is it the youth pastor? Will it be the children's ministry director? Will it be the school principal? Will it be the teachers? Will it be the pastor? Will it be your kids' friends? Remember the garden responsibility has never changed. The person who will be held accountable is the Father. And that will not change. Men, we've got hard work to do. But we're not alone in this. Return to God. Do the best that you can faithfully. Love your kids. Love your spouse. If you're estranged from your child right now, I pray that God will put it on your heart that as long as the peace depends upon you to make every effort, every effort. And so, I ask that in this, the generations will be changed. Generations will be changed. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I'm so thankful, Lord. Thankful for the responsibility and the role that you've given us, Lord, as fathers and as mothers. Very simple, but if there are men here today who are not walking out their faith at home. I don't need for them to raise their hands, God. You know who they are. I pray today they would return to you, they would repent, and you would fill them, O oh Lord, with wisdom. You would fill them, O oh Lord, with grace. I pray, God, that in the areas in which we struggle as men, I pray, Father, that we would know that we're not by ourselves. I pray that we would not remain silent, oh God, and waste away. I pray, Lord, that they would continue to fight the good fight of faith. For there are generations, Lord, that are counting on us. I pray, Father, for the mothers who have found themselves in a position in which they were divorced or from the very beginning disconnected from one in whom was to be a father. Lord, I pray that the burden that they carry, Lord, 
that you would provide for them richly, Lord, a reward. I pray, God, that you would give them, Lord, clarity in how to live honorably unto the Lord with a feisty young man or young woman at home. I pray, Lord, that they would see their efforts and their experience to be fruitful, Almighty God. I pray for the fathers here today, those, Lord, who did not grow up with their fathers. Lord, I pray that if they have children, Lord, I pray that the vision of godliness would be permeated throughout their home. I pray, God, for an injection of love. I pray, God, for those in whom are single, Lord, who don't have children. I pray that this message, Lord, would gird them in the truth and that they would, Lord, walk as men who are godly, O oh, Father, in all in which they would think, say, and do. I pray for the children here today. I pray, God, that their eyes are opened. I pray, God, that relationships, Lord, continue to be built and their understanding of who you are, God, continues to be cultivated and developed. And so, Father, I pray this day that those who are far from you would hear the call to return back to you. Father, we thank you, we love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. To stream more of our past video sermons, please check out our YouTube channel or our website at endurancechurch.com. You can also learn more about our church, our various ministries, and how you can get involved. Again, our website is endurancechurch.com. We'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line anytime at info at endurancechurch.com. God bless you, and thanks for being part of our online service today.